What's up y'all today? I'm gonna be showing you how to build the best mob farm for all the mods 8 I can't tell you how many times that I've used this design to do the all the mods star speed runs that I like to do This is probably hands down the best way to get a lot of resources in the game And it's actually very easy to set up. So let's jump right in So the first thing we're gonna need to do is grab some spawners unlike vanilla You can actually relocate any spawner you find and the easiest way to do this is by making cardboard boxes from the mod mechanism. You can also do this by getting silk touch on a pickaxe, but I think cardboard boxes are usually easier to get in the early game. The easiest way I've found to make this is actually by making something called the pulverizer. You'll need some kind of power, but basically all you have to do is place it down, throw in some oak logs, and the pulverizer will make you sawdust. Inside of a crafting table, all it takes is four sawdust and you can get yourself one cardboard box. Cardboard boxes are actually really easy to use. All you have to do is come up to the spawner that you wanna pick up, right click it with a cardboard box, and then you can just break it with any tool and you'll get yourself the cardboard box back. This cardboard box does have data inside of it, so all you have to do to get the cardboard box back and to place it is just place Place that cardboard box that has the data in it, shift, right click, and it will take the cardboard box off. And that's all you have to do to move spawner. Go ahead and get yourself at least five spawners for this build. Don't worry about what mobs that the spawner spawn, we'll change that next. If you use a mob egg on a spawner, the spawner will then change to the mob of the egg that you use. This is how we'll set which mobs we want to spawn from our spawners. So we need to get some specific mob eggs and we're not going to be using the capturing enchant. There is actually a very easy way to get mob eggs and we need to make something called a mob swab. These collect the DNA of a mob by right clicking on a mob with the swab. So go out and find the mob that you want to use in a spawner, then swab it. For this tutorial, I want you to go out and grab these five mobs. One blaze, one cave creeper, one enderman, one witch, and one wither skeleton. Now, once you have the swabs, you need to take that DNA and convert it into a mob egg. And to be able to do that, we need buckets of experience. So the easiest way to get a bucket of experience is to make the experience crystal. This is from the mod utility X. We're gonna need this later on in our mob farm setup anyway, so you might as well make it now. To use the crystal, all we need to do is place it down and use the arrows to put your levels into it. If you have enough experience stored, you'll be able to right click on the crystal with a bucket and get yourself a bucket of experience or essence it doesn't matter so go ahead and collect about five buckets worth of experience with these we can make a special chicken feed that we can use to get those mob eggs you take the bucket of experience and you combine it with one seed and then one of those five mob swabs with the dna on it and you'll get yourself some chicken feed now we get to go feed some chickens. Find yourself a chicken, right click it with the feed and we get our mob egg. Now pro tip, if you plan on making more mob eggs in the future using this method, I would definitely make yourself a chicken spawner. So get yourself a chicken egg first, then use it on a spawner to make yourself a chicken spawner. All right, so we have five spawners and five mob eggs. It's time to start building the mob farm. To start with, you wanna start by making a nine by nine square. The reason it's nine by nine is because the center part for us to spawn mobs on will be a seven by seven. This is important because certain mobs need a certain amount of space to be able to spawn. Now what you want to do is you want to decide which way is going to be your entrance. So for this, I want my entrance to be right here. So I'm going to break out a three block wide entrance way. This is also going to be where we're going to set up our kill zone too. From here, we'll build outwards so that we have a four by five area. This is to make a three by three hole for our kill zone. What we want to do now is we want to break out two blocks deep and then on the bottom you need to put some kind of redstone you could use redstone torches you can use redstone glass i like redstone glass because redstone glass looks the coolest but pretty much anything that gives off a redstone signal then this is where we're going to put our mob mashers for this build we're going to be using nine Now, if you're in the early game, you can always just use three at a time. You could start with three and then build up to six and then to nine, depending on how many resources and stuff that you have in the early game. For each of these mob mashers, we're going to go ahead and upgrade them. Now, there's only two upgrades I usually like to use, and that is the sharpness upgrade and the looting. Sharpness makes it where it kills things faster. Looting just gives you more loot. Each mob masher takes 10 of each upgrade. So if you want to upgrade all nine of these, you'll need 90 of each of the upgrades you like. And so far, this is what we should have. 
The next step we want to do is we want to replace the floors with something that will push our mobs around. You have several options, but the two that I like the most is using an entity conveyor or using vector plates from the mod Dark Utilities. The vector plates are cheaper, but for this, I'm just going to go ahead and use entity conveyors. What we want to do is we want to break this out and then place it so that the arrows point towards the center on each of these sides. And then in the very center, make a straight line back to your kill zone. With this setup, it basically makes it where any mobs that spawn will come in, spawn in, and then go to the center and then be pushed into our kill zone. This is exactly what we want. Now, if you're having trouble building this, you could always hold shift and walk around on top of this, and that way you won't actually be sliding around. Be careful though, you could always disable the mob mashers by taking out the redstone, so that way you don't accidentally slide in and die. So now we wanna go ahead and build up. So for this build, I'm gonna be using five spawners. So I want a total build height of 11. You can use any building block that you would like to, but for this, I'm gonna just build the four corners up and then fill everything else in with glass. That 11th block will be your ceiling block, so keep that in mind. For the kill zone, it doesn't really matter how tall you build it. I like to build it four blocks tall, so that way I can make a 3x3 three three window or door. Now, if you need a way in and out, you could always use something called ethereal glass. Basically, this makes it where you can pass through it and only players can pass through, but mobs cannot. This is the easiest way that I've found to be able to build something to where you can get in and out. It's also see-through, so it makes it where it's just like glass, but we can move through it. It's like a glass door. You can use any blocks that you want to from the ceiling, but we're just going to go ahead and fill this in. Overall, the main building should be about a 9x9x11 nine by nine by tall building. As for the kill zone, it's five blocks wide and it comes out from the main building by four blocks and then it's four blocks tall. Now we want to go to the main building and we want to find the exact center of our 9x9 nine nine or 7x7 seven seven floor. You want to take and build three blocks up and then on the third block you can place your first spawner. Now you probably will end up having a problem with mob spawning while you're building this, so go ahead and use a redstone comparator on it to turn it off. All this does is it adds redstone control to the spawner itself. This makes it where we can control the spawner using redstone. We'll set that up after a little bit. Go ahead and break out the three blocks underneath the spawner so that way mobs have room to move and be shoved around underneath. So now we want to go ahead and place the rest of our spawners. So for this, I'm going to have five spawners tall. And then in the very center, you want to place two blocks and then it should connect to your ceiling right here. So if you did this properly, you will have two blocks, five spawners, and then three blocks in between the spawners and the floor. If you want to add more spawners to this, all you need to do is make your building taller, but always make it where there's two blocks between the last spawner and the ceiling. This will prevent mobs spawning on the ceiling itself or the roof and causing an entity pileup because you, you don't want that, I promise. Now we want to set up redstone control. We're going to be using something called a redstone link. All you need to do is on the back side here, place it on each one of the spawners. These can also be set to a specific channel by using a block on one of the frequency slots on the redstone link itself. If you plan on using a channel, make sure all of these are set to the same exact channel. The redstone link also has two modes, transmit and receive. We want to set each one of these redstone links to receive mode. So for us to set this to receive mode, all we have to do is right click it with the create wrench and you can see at the top that there's a little itty bitty thing attached to the antenna and that will set it to receive mode. We want to make sure each one of these are set to receive mode and then we can move on to the next step. Before we move on, we need to make sure to put something on top of the very top redstone link. So on the back side here, we want to place two blocks till it goes up to the ceiling. So that way it stops any mobs from spawning and getting stuck on top of the redstone links. You can use any block if you want to, but I personally find that the vertical slabs look the coolest. Now we want to take our five mob eggs and go ahead and set each of the spawners to the mob that we want to spawn. All you have to do is right click with the mob egg and it will change the spawner to whatever the egg is. Since we're spawning in Enderman, you need to make something called an Ender Inhibitor. This prevents Enderman from teleporting away. It works in an eight block radius, so it's probably a good idea to place two of these. You can place one on the front and one on the back. Sometimes they're a little buggy, so make sure you turn them on and off just to make sure that they work properly. Also make sure not to place these inside because mobs will get caught and hung up on top of them. 
And now we can set up how we're going to turn on and off the spawners. All you need to do is place a redstone link on the outside and then make sure you match the frequencies that you set for all the spawners. All you need to do now is give the redstone link some kind of redstone signal. So I personally like to use a lever. Don't turn this on just yet because if the mobs start spawning and end up dying, all of their mob drops have no way to be collected. So don't turn it on just yet. Now we want to upgrade our spawners. Each of our spawners have a lot of stats when you look at them at the very top. There's also some extra add-ons and upgrades that you can give them. And we're gonna talk about that first. So the most important thing that you need to understand about spawners is that certain mobs have certain conditions to spawn in. For example, certain mobs like hostile mobs need no light to be able to spawn. Whereas like a lot of passive mobs will have to have something like grass underneath them to be able to spawn. A lot and if not all of these conditions can be bypassed by using Using a dragon egg on the spawner. When you use a dragon egg, it will automatically make it where it ignores conditions. Just so you know, every time you kill the ender dragon in all the mods 8, he does drop an extra dragon egg. So we're going to go ahead and use a dragon egg on each one of our spawners. That way, anytime that we want to change the mob that spawned on the spawner, all we have to do is hit it with the mob egg and we don't have to worry about conditions. Another important factor is how far away the player is from the spawner. At the top, you can see activation range. We can bypass this entirely by using a nether star. Once we've hit it, you can see at the top, it says ignores players. This is important. Now, as long as the chunk is loaded, it doesn't matter if players are around or not, the spawner will then still continue spawning mobs. Now let's talk about how to make our spawners faster. So we have two things that determine the speed of how fast mobs spawn, and that's the minimum spawn delay and the max spawn delay. You can reduce the minimum down to 20 using sugar. And to reduce the maximum spawn delay, all you have to do is use clocks. Just as the same as the minimum spawn delay, the lowest that you can get this down to is 20 ticks. Next up, we have the spawn count and the max entities. The spawn count is how many is spawned per wave using the spawner. The max entities is how many total mobs can be spawned from this one spawner. To upgrade the spawn count, we need to use fermented spider eyes. The total and max for this is 16. To upgrade the total max entities, we need to use gas tiers. Max for this is 32. Now we want to take a look at the spawn range. Our spawner is three blocks in every direction and the spawn range on this is set to four so we need to reduce it. Now if you want to increase it and say you want to build a bigger mob farm you could always increase the spawn range by using a blaze rod but if we want to reduce it all you need to do is put a piece of nether quartz in your offhand and then use the blaze rod and it will reduce it. The way this works is that if you want to remove any kind of upgrade from a spawner all you have to do is hold a piece of nether quartz and whatever the upgrade item is if we use it it will remove it so for this instance using a dragon egg will actually take away the ignores conditions if we're holding that nether quartz and we do want that on so i'm putting it back so now i'm going to make sure to set all of these spawn ranges down to three just so that we don't have mobs spawning too far out next up we want to remove the ai from the spawner basically this makes it where things like blazes won't try to fight you nothing will try to fight you using this they just spawn fall slowly to the ground and then get killed. If you're planning on one of your spawners to be a slime, make sure to not use no AI on this. For whatever reason, they can't be killed by anything but the player when they have no AI. It's super weird, but if you're spawning slimes and you're having that problem, that's why. And last but not least, if you don't want the spawners to make any sound when they're spawning, you could always use a piece of wool and this will make them silent. Now we want to set up our collection system. My favorite way to collect items is actually using backpacks. You want to get the highest tier backpack upgrade that you can get but the minimum is about gold so with our backpack we just shift right click to place it down and then we could right click to open it up on the left side we're actually going to see all of these spots over here those are your upgrade slots and we're going to need three upgrades that are a bare minimum for this setup to work the first one being an advanced magnet upgrade this allows us to collect both items and experience into the backpack now the backpack doesn't have a way to store experience unless you give it the tank upgrade the tank upgrade is an absolute must especially if you plan on using this to store experience which we definitely want to do and last but not least we need the advanced void upgrade now how we're going to set this up is to make it where the items that are on the ground will never stay on the ground it'll always go into our backpack we don't want anything backing up on the ground because then that causes server lag and crashes so we need to configure this so on the right side we
we have a little tab specifically for the advanced void settings. Click this and then you want to click this right here to change this to works in GUI as well. Then we want to set this to void overflow. And last but not least, we need to change this from allow to block. The way void overflow works is that it'll start voiding after it has a stack of an item. The main use of this is for us to get rid of things like armor or weapons that drop. As long as it's set to ignore durability and ignore NBT, if you get a piece of diamond armor or if you get a piece of iron armor, whether it's enchanted, halfway broken or not, this will only allow to fill up one slot and anything past that it will void. We set this to block so that that way we can specify which items that we don't want it to void over the stack limit. Now I'm not going to worry about this too much and you could do this if you're in the early game because we're going to be pulling out the items that we want into a separate storage system. But if you don't have a way to set up a storage system just yet, you can always add stack upgrades into your backpack to make it where it'll hold more than one stack and you can have more items. So now if you wanted to test this out, you could turn this on. Once the mob starts spawning and sliding in, you can open up your backpack and you can start seeing the items pouring in. We can see here that the max stack is 1024. So anything past that 1024, it'll start voiding. So now if we won't get any more gunpowder into our backpack here. If we wanted to change that for say diamonds, all we have to do is place that in the block and now it will collect as many diamonds as it possibly can without voiding it. So now we want to have a way to pump all of the items and the experience out. So I'm going to be using a universal pipe from the mod pipes. This allows us to do both items and liquid at the same time. Make sure to shift right click on the pipe that's connected to the backpack. So that way you can set this to extract. If you don't do this, it won't pull any items out. From here, I'm going to right click where it's pulling out and then I'm going to add an ultimate pipe upgrade. You can get by with an advanced one, but if you want this to pull the items out fast enough, you have to go advanced or ultimate. And now we can start connecting things up. If you'd like to pump out the armor so that way it all gets stored, you can use something called an armory cabinet. Now, while this does hold a ton of armor and items, there is no interface on it. So you can't right click to go inside of it and look. If you want to store all the items for something later on, like using like an enchanting factory or breaking down the armors into the items or whatever, go for it. You, you got this. I usually don't use an armory cabinet and I just let the netherite backpack delete and void everything. That's usually how I set this up. We do want this to pump out experience. So I am going to be putting an experience crystal. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but basically all it does is it stores all the experience, which you can easily store all of your levels or pull them in and out just by using the arrows. Now for our items, we want to use a storage controller. We're going to be setting up this controller and nothing will be pulling out just yet until we set up our drawers. So let's go ahead and do that. The way I like to set up my storage system is actually just by using a bunch of two by two drawers. Depending on how many mob drops that you get, you might need more or less, but I'm just going to start out with nine. The first thing that you want to do is you want to take your configuration tool from the mod and right click on each of the drawers. When you right click it, you'll see a little lock pop up at the top. We want to do this for every drawer because this makes it where it doesn't push in or out items unless you tell it to. This is an important step, so make sure that you've locked all of your drawers before you link them to your controller. Next up, we're going to grab the linking tool. With the linking tool, you can right click in the air to set it to either add or remove. We want to set it to add. Now we want to right click on our storage controller so that way this is the controller we're configuring and then you can right click to add a drawer. If you want to add multiple at a time, you can hold shift and right click into the air and then you can right click the top and then go to the bottom and then right click to add all of them at once. Now that our drawers are linked up, we need to upgrade the drawers first. The first upgrade I suggest on using is a void upgrade. It works just like the void upgrade in the backpack is that after a certain limit, it will void anything past whatever the storage capacity is. This is important so that way you don't have items backing up in your backpack. This is just a fail safe so that way you don't have to worry about any items being on the ground from your mob farm. If you want to increase the total amount of storage, especially if you don't want things voided over a certain limit, you can use any kind of tier upgrade with the starter being the copper one. Honestly, just using two or three copper upgrades in each 
each of the drawers is actually huge. It increases the storage by a massive amount. And for this, that's exactly what we're gonna do is just use copper. So now our drawers are linked, they're upgraded, and they're ready for us to set what items go in them. If you've already ran your mob farm, all you have to do is go over to your backpack and then pick out each of the items that you want to store into your storage system. I'm just gonna go ahead and grab a stack of each of these so that way I can set my drawers to exactly what I want. If you've linked your drawers and done everything properly, once you right click to put the item in there, it will automatically pull it out of the backpack and you can see it go into the drawer. You wanna do this for every item that you want to store in your drawers. Once you've done this properly, everything from the backpack will automatically get pulled out and keep that backpack clear and go directly into your storage system. Now that it's all set up and that you've finished your storage collection system, you can turn it on and let the mobs fly. If you like this guide or if you have any questions, make sure to leave a comment below. Hit that like button and subscribe for more all the mods tips and tricks and farms. And as always, thank you so much for watching and bye bye